Welcome to Kinship Cafe. I'm your host, Jim Jones. So glad you could join us. And we are continuing our journey through the Tao Te Ching. And we are currently in chapter 54. And um, we're going to be looking at the Edith and Lombardo translation uh, for this one. Starts off, well planted, not uprooted. Well embraced, never lost. So there's a an idea here that if you are working on something, and I think the assumed background here is something related to the Tao in terms of how you are implementing it in your life, that if it has become, uh, let's say, a solid habit that has been you know, secured uh, the idea of planted, that it's not easy to take it out, and that if it's fully embraced, that it's not easy for it to be taken away or to be lost. Um, and this, I think, may be in, res not response, but in contrast to the previous chapter where we were looking at how easy it is for people to want to walk away from or take a different path from uh, and the top class week was the Great Tao, and we saw how in doing so it created a lot of suffering in terms of the government and how things unfolded. So here we have almost the opposite. Instead of walking away or finding a different path, this is much more of an embracing of it, and in doing so, um, it's, it's looking at it as more of like a solid habit or a way of being that's been embraced here. But then the next line is kind of interesting. Descendants will continue the ancestral rituals. So a uh, couple things start to come into play when we see this. One is it's clearly becoming a multi-generational question or context. So the descendants continuing, um, in this case, it says the ancestral rituals. Um, the other ways that this has been translated and understood is the sacrifice to the ancestors. And uh, at least in one of the sources that I was reading, they were saying that this is in reference to um, the uh, the ruling clan uh, or ruling party of the empire because they were the only family that was actually allowed to commit or to uh, perform sacrifices for the ancestors. Uh, and so that would put us squarely in back in the question about the political aspect in terms of how does the dynasty keep going? How do you, your family stay in power and continue to be the one that's offering the ritual sacrifices, well, it's going to be, at least in this case, if you fully have embraced and implanted um, these core concepts. And again, the implied concept here is, is Tao. Uh, the concept of honoring the ancestors is, it can go either way, and I've seen a lot of the different writers talk about it from both perspectives. So one side would see this as a way of, of remembering them and keeping them uh, present, uh, kind of how we might meet meet up at a, at a cemetery or something on an annual basis to remember somebody who's passed, or we might have some other type of thing that we do where we gather in memory of somebody maybe on the anniversary of their death. That would be maybe more of the naturalistic side of this in the sense of a way of keeping that memory alive. Or the other side of it would be uh, thinking that in some sense that their uh, ancestors are still present in some way. Now, it's not quite the same as how we would have this idea of uh, somebody being up in heaven or um, even, well, so the, the heaven thing would be much more kind of like this dualistic view, but the idea of a ghost may be uh, a little bit closer to what they might be thinking of in, in a certain sense, and that there's uh, 
a way of participating still in this world, but in a different way. And so potentially the ancestors are still involved in life in how they're operating in our experience, but in a different way, not necessarily a different world, because it's still very much a, a single world uh, way that they're looking at things. Um, but there could be, with some of the writers, it looks like this uh, thought that the ancestors are actually participating in some way in what's unfolding in terms of uh, the family's activities. So it's kind of interesting. Um, somewhat related, it's a little bit different, but I I think about, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on the guy's name, but he did these animated movies, uh, Spirited Away and- uh, Hayao Miyazaki. That's the one. And you kind of see like the different little spirits that are involved in the story, uh, like the four spirits and things like that. Um, I, I think there's a little bit of that kind of idea that still persists in some of the writers of this period in terms of how they think about the ancestors. So with that, then where does it go? So it says manifest or excuse me, maintain oneself, uh, this word maintain in almost all the other translators is cultivate. So I'm not quite sure why they went with maintain in this translation, but um, I think there's a big difference in those two words. So if it's maintain, there's the idea that we've already achieved something or we're at the particular level and we're just trying to hold on to it or continue it. Um, whereas cultivate would be that we're trying to develop or grow something in, in this case, in ourselves. So the opening lines, if it's talking about something that's well planted and something that's embraced, then these are going to be potentially talking about we've actually arrived that we're at the point we need to be at and we just need to maintain it and maybe that's the direction they took this um i don't know that they would see the process of becoming more in alignment or in harmony with Tao as something that's achieved as much as it's an ongoing process or more of a way of being so I think cultivate is probably still the better way to translate this, although it may be that they ran with this direction because of how the chapter opens. So um, from here then, it says, if we maintain or cultivate oneself, duh becomes real. So you'll recall that duh is a way of talking about the manifestation of essentially Tao in action. So if Tao is all the, the let's say, um, patterns that exist, how they actually unfold, the particulars in which they actually exist would be the Da. And in the rest of nature, we would see this as a one-to-one -one kind of a correlation between the patterns just unfolding the way that they unfold and the existence of it or the manifestation of that actuality in the particular place that we're looking would just be an example of it unfolding. But there's this perception that because we have our minds that allow us to think and attempt to do things outside of what would just normally unfold, there's always this little tension with people that's different in some respect from the rest of nature and that we can resist or attempt to do something that's maybe not going to be in harmony. It's not that we can ever do anything unnatural. Uh, anything we do, if we can actually do it, is going to be by definition natural. But the attempt to struggle against it is I think where the big problem comes in. And so here it's saying, if we continue to cultivate this desire to be in harmony with Tao, then duh, how it's manifest in our life is going to become more real. And 
they don't get into much here in terms of what we're doing in terms of cultivating that. Um, but we've seen in a lot of the chapters up to this point uh, a number of different things. But it seems at its core, there is an adoption of a worldview that is driving how we act in the world. So the different Tao's that are on offer again, whether it's Confucius or Mencius or any of the other warring states philosophers are going to, you know, if, if we adopt their perspective, then it's going to shape how we act. And the Taoists are on a similar uh, situation that they're also presenting a Tao. It's just that the Tao that they're trying to argue for is one that's above the idea of human construction or something that's like socially derived. It's more of um, just looking at the way that the universe is in a sense. And so depending on where we fall on those perspectives, it's going to uh, have an impact on how things are manifest. And, and so if we are trying to become in harmony with that larger cosmic Tao, then duh, in terms of how that is manifest, it's going to become more real in us as an individual. And previously, if we think back to that transition chapter where we go from the first half of the book to the second half of the book, where it really focuses more on duh, chapter 38, it appears that there's a really big contrast in terms of how duh is even um, talked about. Whereas in some of the other Tao's that are on offer, Da is a little bit more like virtue. It's like a, a set of practices that we try to strive to achieve. Whereas for the Taoist, it seems to be not something that you try to achieve. If you're trying to achieve it, you've actually missed it because you're, you're, you're working at it at a different level that it's more of a natural outgrowth. Once you become more in harmony with with Tao, then Da is a natural consequence. Um, so there's a, a lot of, I don't want to say redefinitions of things, but how they're used is definitely different between the different traditions. So maybe before we go any further, any uh, thoughts or questions on this idea of how you embrace a tradition, in this case, Tao, and the cultivation of it and the outgrowth of Da and the individual. I don't know if I have any questions. I do agree that I think cultivate is a better word um, because I think it's talking about embracing it. And I feel like it's kind of skipping a step. Like it's telling you if it's well planted, not uprooted and well embraced and it's never lost, but then it's skipping to maintenance. Mm. Um, and I think cultivate speaks more to the effort that is necessary mm. mm -hmm. to get there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. And I also don't think it's something that's ever settled. Like, I don't think you ever fully arrive. You might, yeah. even if you are fully in harmony, it's not like the process of how you do that stops. It's it's something that continues. And, and maybe they see that as maintained, but I, I think it's still kind of a cultivate thing. So then it's going to continue, and it says, now maintain the family and uh, becomes abundant. So we start to see more of a, some of this classical idea that you kind of build up the empire from the individual through the family and so forth, which can feel a little bit more like we're talking from a Confucius standpoint, but there's still the social world even within the Taoists. So it's not that 
the Taoists are saying that everybody should be hermits and live by themselves, there's definitely an understanding that we are social creatures and that we exist in community. Um, but they, they, I guess what I would say here is there's that generational thing that we noticed at the beginning in terms of the descendants. And here we're noticing that when we're talking about death, it's not just an individual thing either, but there's also more of a social duh that starts to come into play. So what does that look like? Not just with a bunch of discrete things, but when these discrete things are all operating together, there's a uh, even a larger duh that we could talk about. So um, again, if we look at the forest, yes, the trees are following Dow and the rabbits are following Dow and you know all the different things that are involved. But the overall harmony of the forest and how everything is working together is also a duh. So there's a, kind of a collective or a social aspect of it that comes into play. And, and so we start to see the beginning of it here with this idea of, well, if we also then are working on cultivating the family. And so this would be in those relationships within the family. Now, there's a definite concern that the Taoists talk about in terms of socially constructed ideas, you know, and how do we get back to more of this prior condition that it, they would see as more reminiscent. And, and we're really going to focus on this in the chapter next week where they return to this idea of, of the infant as kind of an ideal, you know, before it's been uh, encumbered with these cultural ideas. So with the family, this is one of the areas where you run into a lot of these social constructs in terms of how is it supposed to be structured? What is the proper relationship, you could say, between parents and children or between the spouse or between the siblings and so forth, uh, and even multi-generational when you have the, the grandparents involved? So there's... Um, a lot that we could say if we think back to like that our evolutionary history and and back to like say hunter gatherer type of context where before you had a larger cultural um construct that is defining in the sense of like rules for how family is supposed to behave there is kind of pre-wired into us these pro-social traits that cause us to be able to function well in community, whether we're talking about family or small tribe. And nobody has to really tell you how to do it. It's just part of what's wired into us. And these are going to be things where we seem to have an innate sense of fairness. We have uh, a, a basic idea of tit for tat <laughs> that kind of comes up in terms of how humans react to each other and there's definitely a compassion that we have for those that we're more closely related to and there's also aspects of altruism that are just part of that human nature that seems to exist without anybody having to tell you to do it you don't have to be taught to do these things they're just there and so I think this would be the aspect of which they're looking at the family, not that we need to impose these culturally defined norms of how the family is supposed to be, but allowing more of that natural aspect, again, trying to get at that unencumbered uh, way of things existing that would be the goal for the Taoist here. <clears throat> and maybe I'll pause there. Um, what are your thoughts on the fact that we have these kind of pre-wired pro-social behaviors in human nature? Does that resonate with you or does that sound uh, strange? I think it, it makes a lot of sense. And like there are all these studies on loneliness and things like that. Um, and how being a part of a community can really like, it's just really good for you. Um, 
And then I think about us all being on our computers all the time and on our phones all the time. And there's kind of this false sense of community. Like you kind of feel like you're seeing all these people on the internet or maybe on social media and things like that, but you're not actually spending time with them. Um, so yeah, it just makes me worry about people in general, um, not getting enough people time, real people time. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I know one of the uh, things that pops up in my mind sometimes when I think about this is how many dysfunctional families <laughs> I come across. And, um, it, you know, it makes me wonder a little bit, like if we have these things that are kind of baked into us, how do we find ourselves in that state? And I, I think that part of it is the dysfunctionalness of the larger culture that we find ourselves in that that leads to how these families are dysfunctional um that's a hard one to unpack but um i do think from what i've seen from a lot of the different neuroscientists that i've looked at uh that there is these inborn traits that we have and that in a in a context where you have generally healthy people in the sense that you don't have, you know, mental dysfunction happening, that it's pretty easy for these traits to be observed and see how they play out. So um, I'm just going to assume that where we see a lot of this family dysfunction, it's, it's actually a larger context that's creating more of that drama uh, than what might normally happen if we were in more of a natural setting. So yeah, I would agree with that. I hmm. think like now when people have dysfunctional families, they go and find their own kind of family. Like a, they'll make their own family, you know, whether it's their friends or a community that they're in or, you know, they find a spouse and they really lean into their spouse's family. Um, hmm. I think, I think you're right. I think the things that we have to navigate because of the way that life is structured now are definitely a, a huge catalyst for a lot of those issues. Mm. Um, but of course, I imagine living naturally, I would say, uh, would have its own issues as well. Yeah. And it's interesting to see, you know, even when they do studies of existing hunter-gatherer tribes, the few that remain, but especially when we go back a couple of cent uh, centuries where there was a little bit more of um, more of them that still existed that we had to be able to study. It's not that they're without conflict or without strife, but they definitely had different ways of dealing with it. And I think in general, um, even though we might just be completely confounded about how, like I, I see sometimes when there's these movies that do documentaries or travel inside these groups and how they live. And it, it's fascinating to me uh, because so many of the things that we think that you need to have in order to survive, you know, like even stuff like giving birth and like, how does this work without hospitals, you know, or just being out in the bush and having a baby or something. And you think, how does that even work? But obviously it does. And we're all here because of a long history of people living that way. But um, yeah, it's, it's fascinating to see what like all the different ways that humans can live uh and we tend to think there's only one way that can work and and we need all these modern conveniences to do it um but obviously that's not true yeah i think the cost of being dysfunctional when you're living a life like that is a lot higher than the cost of being dysfunctional in a life that we live yeah yeah, that's a good point, because uh, when you're operating as a, a little tribe, then you don't have the ability to just 
go off and and leave and just be on your own because you can't really survive and so there's there's probably more of a pressure for how do we maintain appropriate relationships um which i think you know we look at it as that can be a little bit more of a cage too right where it's like oh yeah well they're just pressured to do that because they don't want to you know be left behind um but it's I don't know. There's, I think, pros and cons with that. Obviously, the pressure or the con the control mechanisms are are still going to be there in a the sense of you know conform or be left behind. Um, but I, th it seems as though, and this may be more of a, a naive view, that there's not as much of a damaging control in terms of like a negative control to bring about the conformity. It's more of you know, this is how we have to be if we're going to live kind of a thing. Yeah. It's it's interesting for sure. So um, maintain the community or cultivate the community and da uh, becomes extensive. So we're seeing like this ever growing uh, size of da where, you know, it's it's kind of with each step, they're using bigger and bigger words to talk about it. Um, and community, we would still be at, I think, where, again, if we're thinking about that hunter-gatherer period, this would be maybe at that level of the tribe. So we've got the family and then the tribe where we may actually be related to most of the people in that tribe. And so a lot of our normal pro-social stuff would still be interacting. There tends to be more of a distinction between in-group and out-group at that point. Um but within the community, we can see how, again, there's this social aspect of da that continues to grow. But then the next level of the country. Now, here is kind of where we cross that line between what we're kind of born with, what, what comes in our genetic and evolutionary wiring to something that requires something new or something that's uniquely human in the sense of how do we start to have larger groups actually exist uh, together? And so uh, in our human evolutionary time scale, this is going to be something that only really becomes possible after we kind of cross that agricultural threshold where we learn how to uh, be settled and produce enough food to la allow a larger community to grow. And then the different aspects of society that emerge in order to address the different demands that you have at that point in terms of you know, how do you protect your location and how do you manage the surplus and provide for the different levels of um, a country that are needed that are not necessarily where everyone is producers, but some of them are, are simply benefiting from the larger body that's producing excess than what they need for themselves. And how that gets arranged then is where we really see the questions about culture coming into play and the rules that are involved, the laws that are involved, the ideology that gets involved. This is where I think religion starts to take a larger role in terms of how communities function. It's one of the ways that they try to, from more of an ideological perspective, um keep everything in check how you develop what anthropologists will talk about is in terms of a fictive kinship where we identify with other people as as though we're related even though we might be strangers in order to develop more of that larger identity um that's necessary when we're talking about a, a country or a nation state or something along those lines so this i think is where we definitely end up with 
something where there isn't necessarily a uh, out of the box solution, but requires a little bit more ingenuity in terms of how do we start to think about structuring the country uh, in a sense to be a reflection of Dow in the sense of you know how do we how do we now move into this more artificial terrain to look at designing it in such a way that it is a, in continuity with what we see in more of that natural sense coming from the individual through the family through the community or the tribe into this larger context and certainly this is where we start to have a lot of the dialogue between the different philosophers of this period because we're at the country level when we're dealing with the problem of the warring states period how did we end up in this place of contact of of uh, chaos with everybody fighting each other and so really this is where all of these philosophical writings are coming into play is trying to answer this question how do we do country how do we do larger social groupings and what are the the social controls that should be used in that context and and this i think is where it's not as easy to answer that question and why there's so much disagreement and different ideas about how this should play out um, it's interesting to see historically how you know if we take two of the biggest players at least the ones that that persist still in china in terms of confucianism and and taoism how confucianism really won out on this question because it was much more hierarchically based and i think was more conducive to the idea of how do you structure something like a country but there was definitely an appeal that the Taoists and, and others along those lines had for how a country could be done that wouldn't require the same type of Confucius style hierarchy. Makes you wonder if it's possible, you know, that that once we move into those larger groupings, you know, is there a way to do it that's not going to um move us inherently out of harmony with with Tao. that you know there's so much going on in our world right now not only still with wars but when we think about things like uh you know climate change or just even pollution in general how much of that could have been avoided or is it possible to even have larger groupings of people and and not have those things happen that's that's the interesting question yeah, I was just thinking about what life would look like if if the groupings were much smaller. Like if there were still a, a lot of them, but they were just smaller, what that might look like. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, things like our technology and and the other things that we have access to now wouldn't probably be possible if we hadn't moved into these larger structures that allowed for more uh, specialization and dedication to different aspects of learning and and being able to experiment and develop the things that we've developed but there's always a trade-off and you know what are going to be the consequences of that are we going to make it through this strange phase that we find ourselves in it's almost like we're in a a new warring states period but not necessarily uh just you know from the war perspective but more of the you know environmental or ecological questions about how do we get out of this chaos is there a way through and then um it takes it out to uh the furthest extent uh again world here would be that Tiansia, the everything under heaven, the human social sphere, uh, human the the realm of human interaction, and so uh, this I think would actually be taking it to across different countries, but I'm not sure 
if they looked at it just in terms of the empire. And so were they looking at country as the different states within the empire and that the world would be the empire and how it would become, in a sense, this largest level of da, or were they looking at it even beyond, in the case of like China, to other countries? Um, it's hard to know exactly how they were thinking about it at this point, but this would be like the largest grouping or out thinking that they have and what that included or not, I don't know, but um, obviously there's that line from the individual all the way out to the entire social world, whatever that might have represented for them. So then we have our therefore, and it starts with, again, going back to the individual, through self, contemplate self. And maybe if I bring up the next one and you'll kind of get a sense of where this is going to go through family, contemplate family. Um, how we understand da and being in harmony with Tao is going to be situationally dependent. So at the self, there's a certain way of looking at things that needs to be understood or contemplated. But when we go to the level of family, it's not the same as self, right? There's a difference between them. And it's obviously you've got more uh, players that are interacting that need to be taken into consideration that are shaping how we think about Da and how we think about Dao and balance. So each of these levels of interaction come with their own concerns in terms of what does this look like in terms of how this plays out. And it's going to, as you may have guessed, step through the next couple of things in a similar way. So through community, contemplate community, through country, contemplate country, and through world, contemplate world. Um, there's been some interesting ways that this gets translated, the, this series of things. One of them is what we're seeing here that you know, through community or through self or through family is is the perspective of which you want to look at this question. But the other way that it's been translated, um, I wouldn't say like 50-50, but, but maybe close, is something along the lines of through self, observe or contemplate or understand other selves through your family, understand other families, through your community, understand other communities. Um, and that becomes interesting too, because then you're getting into more of an idea of like compare. And I think the interesting thing that that line of thinking brings up is breaking us out of a view in which the limited amount of experience that we've had tends to shape how we look at things, but when we're exposed to how other people are doing things, we might realize, oh, there's more to this. There's other ways that people look at this. Or there's other things that exist out in the world. And sometimes when we're exposed to a limited set of things, it we don't realize that it's limited or maybe that something that we're doing is kind of odd. An example that I use sometimes in my family, which was kind of an interesting thing for me growing up, is my, uh, I guess his great uncle, um, went through a thing where they had their kids, uh, but then 20 years later, they had another set of kids, same husband and wife, they just, you know, late in life ended up having a, a another couple of kids <laughs> and they were significantly younger than the other siblings. And so they ended up just referring to them as baby boy and baby girl. They had names, but that was just what everybody referred to them as. And so when I grew up, I actually had an uncle boy and an aunt girl, and it just seemed completely normal to me. 
that I, you know, this was the case until I think I was in high school and I happened to mention something about uncle boy or something like that. And they just looked at me like, what are you talking about? What do you mean uncle boy? And it was only at that point I realized, oh, this is really odd. <laughs> I never noticed that it was odd because I just grew up with it. So um, there's all kinds of things in our world that are like that, where we just grow up with certain things and we think, well, this is normal. And then somehow we come in contact with somebody who does things different. And it, it, it's that contrast where we can start to see a little bit more broadly or the uniqueness of the things that we are doing. Um, so I kind of like that comparison idea of this as well, that, you know, how do we look at other families compared to our family and other cultures and other communities compared to our community? And, and maybe that's another way that we can look at that cultivation. Um, so, and, and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, that there's still the the concerns that are, let's say, level specific between self, family, community, where there's different concerns at each of those levels that need to be addressed. But how we address those concerns might be informed by looking at how other people are doing it. It's interesting you, you say comparison, because my mind went to compassion. So like through your family and the issues that you experience or the things just in general that you experience in your family teach you that every other family is probably dealing with the same things mm. or similar things or even different things. Um, mm. And to look at those families with an eye of compassion um, based on that and try to understand them and try to understand how they differ uh, and learn from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, also, I have a funny story as well. Not an aunt and uncle, but a pet. Uh, we had a cat growing up and my sister kept coming home from school with different names for the cat. And so my dad finally got fed up and he was like, its name is Dog. <laughs> and it stuck. And so we had a cat named Jog and she lived a very long time and she was an outdoor cat. So the whole neighborhood, like kids would walk home from school up our street and everybody would say hi to Dog the cat. Um, <laughs> so it's very funny. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. It's, it's funny how many things that we have no idea that we had such a limited perspective on until we come across other things. But um, but there's a lot of them, and and it just adds to our ability to think about, you know, self, family, community, country, when we get exposed to those additional ideas. I think in a positive way. There's a lot of fear associated with that too, right? Because if we get exposed to different ideas, then that could mean that something's going to change and people don't tend to do well with change. And so sometimes we really try to secure those borders and not allow those different ideas or thoughts to come in. Um, and so this might even be a way of trying to combat that isolation that can happen in terms of trying to preserve one single way of looking at things that maybe isn't healthy. Yeah, it's interesting because we've talked about tradition before and maintaining those traditions, but then it says, you know, through family, contemplate family, and it's trying to figure out how everybody can live in harmony across these traditions mm -hmm. um, and I think that can be really hard to like kind of merging traditions and figuring out what's right for well not maybe not necessarily what's right but what what everybody can agree to honor as far as traditions go yeah um, I think it's really challenging for sure yeah then it has a conclusion that we've come across before and there is no good answer or definitive answer i should say for what it means but we'll just <laughs> kind of roll with it here 
So how do I know the world or how do I know the world is like this that, you know, that it's been talking about? And the answer is like this. <laughs> um, so cheeky. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> uh, one of them that I thought was an interesting answer is that this was as though someone was actually speaking it, that they may have gestured to themselves, right? So how do I know this? Because of this, right? Um, or it could mean because of everything I just said, um, you know, in the prior in the text there, you know. But it's it's an interesting response that shows up a couple of times in the Data Jing, and and uh, nobody knows exactly how the, how this is an answer or what the yeah. answer is with this, but it, it's an interesting conclusion. They decided to have some fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Yeah, maybe they were gesturing to the world. Maybe, maybe. Well, uh, that's our text for today. Uh, any final thoughts or observations on that? Me. Dwayne, any final comments or first comments? <laughs> <laughs> I think the only thing that crossed my mind is like how many families or countries or communities may look dysfunctional from the outside, but they're their functioning is just different from ours. So somehow they still work and persevere and 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 just understanding that, you know, it just may be a different point of view that helps them accomplish their 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 own form of functionality. Even if you see people like screaming at each other and everything, they're still that's just how they communicate. <laughs> so uh, that's a great point. I uh, I notice some cultural differences in that regard, where there is in some cultures a little bit more of this idea of of machismo or kind of like male aggression that is kept in check by essentially other people in the community that either it's designed in such a way that you're able to vent or share or demonstrate like anger or rage in a very powerful way. But the expectation is that your friends are going to hold you back, that you don't actually do it, that you're not actually getting to a point of violence. But the the structure is such that it encourages um, the expression of it, even though it's not expected to be acted on and <clears throat> that's extremely different from at least the family context that i grew up in where uh you don't fly off the handle you don't let yourself express that way because that would be an example of being out of control and um it was very interesting within the the different family dynamics where these things kind of came together of understanding you know that getting loud or upset wasn't necessarily that you know everything's out of control and something was wrong but it was just a different way of being able to hopefully safely express these things right um and and uh, and consequently my being more reserved was interpreted as not caring or not being invested. And so it was a very interesting kind of bicultural um, learning that had to happen about these different ways of responding to things, which definitely, you know, if you look at the different family structures on the two different sides would have been very different from each other. And it'd be very easy to label one as dysfunctional on either direction, depending on where you happen to be, one would be saying, you know, oh, well, they just suppress their emotions and they don't respond to things or they're, they don't care about what's going on. Or on the other side, thinking these guys are a bunch of hotheads and they're out of control, you know, but really there's different 
ways of processing the same information, but everybody still has that same, um, you know, emotional responses to things. It's just processed in very different ways. Yeah. Well, I think this will probably be a good place to bring it to a close. Uh, if you're watching the video and you'd like to participate, you can register your email at www.kinship.cafe and you'll get an email with the Zoom links that we do on Friday morning. Or if you happen to be in the Southern California area where we meet in person and hope to see you guys all next week. Bye. Thanks, Jim. Thank you.